peace, be still. That's the theme of today's message from Mark chapter 4. And when I think about that, peace be still, it, it's a reminder to me anyway that even when there is a storm, even when there is a you know, thing going on in my life that might you know, tear it to pieces, so to speak, I can still listen to Jesus who would tell me, peace be still. And it's a lesson I think everybody needs to learn in life, peace be still. You know, I, I've used it in classrooms. I've, you know, it, we're supposed to do biblical integration, as they call it, at our school. And basically what it means is that we, you know, weave the Bible into everyday experiences at the school. And so what I do, I try to do, is in that biblical integration, sometimes with kids, I'll just say, peace be still, you know, and see if it'll work. Um, that was our memory verse the other day in a Bible class because I had so much going on, I had to work through it. So I said, here it is, folks, be still and not know that I'm God. Find it in the Bible and then, you know, sit there and think about it for the next half hour. And so that simple statement from the mouth of Jesus changed the disciples' world, both physically and spiritually. And what I like about it is that in this case, it did change and correspond the physical and the spiritual, but it's not always that way. Sometimes there's still a storm. Sometimes God stills the storm. Sometimes there's still a storm, but either way, the message is peace be still. And I like this picture. I don't know if you can see it. Maybe after the teaching, you can get closer to it and take a look, but it's actually a guy out in the middle of a a lake or a sea and there's storms on both sides and he's on a train track actually that's a train track there it's not a pier uh, but on the end uh, at the end of it is a train coming toward him a train heading his way and and again if I were to look at that guy I, I'm, I'm sort of glad I'm not him but then there's days where I go that's exactly who I am uh, maybe you can relate to that guy and I don't know what advice I would give him again uh, can't outrun a train right can't dive to the left or the right. Uh, you're kind of out in the middle of nowhere and, and there's a drown on either side and a train headed your way. And when you think about that, whatever advice I might give him, I guess I give the same advice this chapter gives, which is peace, be still. Because one way or another, uh, you're going to encounter God very soon. Um, he's either going to intervene and take care of the situation or you'll be meeting him personally and you can ask him why that happened. And so our verse-by-verse verse study of Mark brings us to the last seven verses of chapter 4 in Mark. And it tells the story of Jesus stilling a storm and commanding the calm in the midst of a chaos. And it's there in Mark 4, verse 39. You can check me out on this. It, we find those wonderful words, peace be still. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. It, the, the main message here, the main thought is that we all have storms and we all need peace. And so I put it this way, a storm is the norm, and storms come in many forms, right? That's the thing to remember. Some of them are physical. You know, if you've ever lived through a natural disaster, uh, right, you know what I'm talking about there, where some, suddenly you have a nice day one day, and the next day all your stuff is strewn about whatever lawn you have and all that kind of thing, and you've seen that on the news at least. But storms come in many forms, right? Uh, there are times when uh, it's a supernatural uh, storm, you know, the same way you could have a natural disaster, you can have a supernatural disaster, or you can just have a emotional disaster or whatever. There's a lot of different ways. And so I say it's the norm because a lot of times we're kind of shocked or surprised when they happen, but the Bible suggests we should be shocked or surprised when they don't happen. Um, because really there's it's just part of the human condition. There's stormy relationships with family or friends. There's job jolts, right? There's financial freeze outs, that sort of thing, emotional earthquakes, whatever other things you'd want to think on with these that can cause waves of worry in people's lives. And I like to think of it this way. I mean, life's a, a rough road, right? But it's a toll road. It takes a toll. Um, you know, not everything's toll house cookies. I always like those, you know, the chocolate chip cookies. But, but, a toll house or a toll booth is that thing where you're just going along a road and it's like not hard enough, but you're going to charge me every few miles. That's how I always felt in Florida. I was like, come on, man. I like, like I'm not spending enough here and gas and, and everything else. And I got to chuck, you know, dollars into this thing along the way. And, and so you think about it, life's a toll road, right? But at the same time, 
it can be a, a time in our lives that we learn so much in the midst of those things. If life's about something, it's certainly got for me to be about learning and, and experiencing things, both good and bad, but grow, drawing close to God in that. And I think of 1 Peter 4, this is an important verse. It says in verse 12, 1 Peter 4, 12, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange was happening to you. He's basically saying it's the norm. Don't, don't go like, why me? Why is this happening? He says, well, why wouldn't it be happening? Um, the wind and the waves, again, just part of life. And so I know I can certainly act shocked and surprised when things go wrong. Um, but I have a saying over at the school because, you know, people bring me their broken computers. And um, they always say, I don't know what went wrong. And I'm like, I don't know what went right. I mean, how long have you had this computer? And they're like, five years. What have you done with it? Schlepped it in my backpack and left it out in the car and done everything. I, I'm shocked that it made it this far. So they're shocked that it's broken. I'm shocked that it ever worked. You know, and, and in some ways, the more you know about the complexity of a computer, the more surprised you are that it ever turns on and keeps working. And so I think about that and I go, you know, the complexity of life, actually, when things are calm and normal, I go, well, this is abnormal, right? And so Jesus says into that place in our life, peace be still, and I'll read it with you there in Mark 4.35. He says, on the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to him, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took Jesus along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. See, there's a lot in this Mark account of this. I love it. And one of the great things is this is a, an event that probably you're familiar with, if you're at all familiar with the Gospels. And I say plural because there's other accounts of it. And what's nice is you can draw off of those. But I really want to focus on the way Mark told this story because he told it really amazing, very to the point, you know, not a lot of different details. So the details that he did choose are interesting to me. Uh, first of all, he sets the scene by letting us know that he had been in the boat all day. Why was he out on the boat? Well, you remember it maybe from a previous passage of Mark where he said, uh, he pushed out in the boat to get away from the crowd. He told the disciples, get a boat ready because these guys are going to crush me. They're going to, you know, mush us all with their needs. And there's going to come a time when we're going to need to push out into that boat. And so they did. This was not just a little vacation for them. It was a necessity for them. He needed some space and he knew that they did too. So many people were pushing and shoving for his attention that Jesus in fact, got in the boat to keep from being crushed. And when you think about this, he was teaching, and he had something everyone wanted to hear. But what I love about it is that they also saw things that he did. And I think what's great about Jesus is not only what he said, but what he did. His example was simply instructive, even when he kept his mouth shut, right? And so what you see in here is when he wasn't helping and touching and teaching people, he still did get away to himself. And so, so many people had so many needs, and I wrote it down this way. Needy people can be greedy people. What do I mean by that? Well, we can all be needy. I'm not saying other people are and I'm not. I can be as needy as anybody, but when I'm needy, I'm greedy. And what I mean by that is I'm genuinely not thinking too hard about whether you're going through a storm yourself. If I'm going through a storm, I'm thinking about me, me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity there. And so I'm thinking about how this affects me. I'm not think, looking around thinking, well, this affects a lot of people a lot of ways. Now, some people are so selfless, so Jesus-like that they are thinking about others even during those times. But for the most part, I can tell you needy people can be greedy people. And long, difficult days for Jesus, people didn't look over and say, well, Jesus looks tired. Jesus looks pressured. Jesus looks like he could use a rest. They were like, I have number 75 in line and you're only on number 25 and you'd better not go out in the boat before you get to me. Because again, needy people are greedy people. And I say that primarily to tell us that the needs will be endless, which means if you are a person given to meeting the needs of others, you have to take some nod from Jesus and realize that you have to meet a need of your own as well, which is a need sometimes just simply to have some peace and be still. 
And so when I think about this, the most needy people are never going to say, oh, man, you look like you could use some time off. That you look like you could need maybe a rest or some time away from this situation. No, nope, they don't tend to do that. They tend to press on with their needs. And so this is interesting because, again, it says Mark 4.35, the same day when evening came. What was the same day? A day where needy people had just about crushed him. And he gets out into the boat with his disciples. And he says to the disciples, let's cross over to the other side. Now, the place he was talking about there is the Sea of Galilee. Again, that's an important thought because it's, it's sometimes also called the Lake of Gennesaret. And it exists still to this day. Uh, and... It's a very volatile situation there. It, storms can come out of nowhere there. A storm is the norm and they come in many forms. Okay, so depending on the season, uh, things can really happen at that Sea of Galilee. And you might go there one day and take your pretty pictures. Here's the Sea of Galilee. And later that same afternoon, people are like running for cover in that same place because the storm comes up so quickly. And so I think about that, and, and it's an interesting thought here. But here's the one I want to really spend just a moment on. And I know you missed it because I missed it about the first however many times I read this in my life. But I saw it recently. And it's this, verse 36. They took Jesus along as he was. I don't know if you see that in your translation, but that's what the New King James says. They took Jesus along as he was. Now, it's a funny kind of phrase. And I'm going to give you this to look at here up on the screen, right? He became as he was so we can become as he is. What is that thought? It simply means this. If you ever see an as is house, you know what it means? It means it's a fixer upper. That's what it means. If you're selling your house as is, what is it you know as an owner? Eh, it's got a few fixer things. It's got some stuff that needs repair right and i am not warranting it i'm not going to sell it to you and then when the roof collapses say uh oh, wow that's on me as the seller nope that's on you as the buyer you are buying it as is and when you think about that phrase again i went and looked at it in the original language it's it's just what it says it says they took jesus along as he was as he was was a little broken down now again you got to remember this is god as a man right and so here is Jesus, and there are several times in Scripture this is confirmed where it says he was hungry, he was thirsty, he was tired, he was pressured, right? I mean, so if it's true of God, can it not be true of me? And so they took him along as he was. What it means is he didn't get to shower first. He didn't get to get all messiahed up before he got in that boat. He was just him. He was just kind of battered and bruised, so to speak, from the day. He had been teaching all day. He had been touching people all day. He was dirty. He was stinky. And life was busy for him, and it pressured him. And he got into the boat with a need just like they had one. And they had a different need than he had. And we'll see this in it. And that's why I wrote down, he became as he was, so we can become as he is. He willingly went through this world. That's what I mean by that. He submitted himself to the same things that we go through. So we can't ever say, God, you simply don't get it. You don't understand. He says, sure I do. They took him along just as he was. And his life, again, was like that. But it's also so we could become as he is, to show, to show an example. He showed an example, first of all, of his willingness to lower himself to our level. But he also showed a desire to lift us to the level that he has contact with, which is the eternal level, right? I hope, I hope you see that. I hope you'll think on it when you look at it later. If I'm making it up, just tell me. But go in and look at it. There wasn't a break in Jesus's life, and he was a little broken down from that. Not sinful, but just plain exhausted. And see, I think about that, and a lot of times people equate the two. People apologize to you for being tired. Jesus, you know, wasn't saying, oh, well, I'm such a mess. Don't take me on the boat. They took him as he was. And that means God will take me as I am when I'm like that. But he also has somewhere he wants to take me in the process. 
Very important. So Jesus left the same boat he'd been in all day, in the same clothes he'd been in all day, quickly fell asleep, but the day wasn't over, right? The disciples were about to get a pop quiz over the lessons that Jesus was teaching them that day. And so verse 37, Jesus didn't need to learn this. He already knew it. They did not. And so a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Basically, you have water coming over the side. The Sea of Galilee, again, it's a body of water that's about 13 miles by 7 miles, um, and it is 600 feet below sea level, and it's surrounded by mountains. Again, if you think about a geography built for crazy weather extremes, that's certainly one. And there are times in that area, again, that we waves can get in excess of 15 feet in a very short time. That's pretty uh, much a tempest in a teacup, right? I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase, but sometimes big waves in a little lake are worse than huge waves out in the sea, right? Because they're just so pounding back against each other and the waves coming back against the shore and everything. So it says a great windstorm arose, no warning. And the waves were coming over the top of the boat. Now, I can't hear this and may, or read that without thinking the weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. But when you think about this, these were not landlubbers, right? This was not Gilligan uh, type of people. This was, this was uh, you know, the skipper was a pretty good uh, sailor back then. But, but these 12 disciples... Among them were professional fishermen, not all of them. You know, some of them were tax uh, people and things like that. There were other people from other walks of life. But certainly, at least four that we know of made their living on this place. They lived on this lake and in their surrounding places. They were very used to it. And so people have different capacities, probably, for dealing with different things. You know that. If you have uh, friends or you have kids or you have anything else there's some people who as they say drown in a cup of water and there's people who can withstand amazing things but you see guys who were cool under pressure and this was enough to have them losing their cool they're all yelling now we're gonna sink we're done and I don't know if you've ever had that sinking feeling but when you're thinking you're sinking um, again, one of the reasons you don't come to the aid of drowning people, even people who are really good swimmers drown from drowning people because needy people are greedy people, right? They're not thinking, oh, you might drown. They're thinking, I'm drowning, and they will push a friend even under the water at that point. You think about what's going on here. This is a tumultuous time in their life. You can picture the 12 disciples bailing like crazy, and trying to yell to each other and, you know, nobody's the leader, so everyone's the leader. And uh, bail this side, no, that side. What are you doing, Matthew? Get over here, you stupid. You know, and all that kind of stuff. And you look over and they're not going to be at their best behavior, right? And so they look over and see one guy not bailing. There's 13 people on the boat, right? You remember, Jesus was on the stern. <laughs> and Mark says it, they were, he was asleep on a pillow. I can only picture Gracie at our house who always finds a pillow to be asleep on, right? And if, she, if there's a pillow on a pillow, she's going to be on top of that with a blanket on top of it. And you're like, wow, she just stacks up the softest possible thing, you know? But you see this, it says he's asleep on a pillow. And they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, I don't know about you. Again, this is quite a picture. Twelve panicky people hanging on for dear life and the spiritual leader, right? The most mature guy. The one that's the teacher and the, the guru, so to speak, sound asleep on a pillow in the back of the boat. And when you read pillow, you need to know, again, I made it kind of a fluffy pillow, but it's, it's not that. What it is, is it's actually the place where the person who was steering would sit. It was that thing in a boat where you've got kind of like a leather... Uh, you know, spot, a cushion built in where the person steering and making sure the thing was going the right place in that all important captain's cushion. That's what, what it was. And they're like, yeah, he's, he's asleep in the captain's chair. You think about that, they had reached a point of total despair. If you've never been in a situation, you know, physically or emotionally like this, you can at least put yourself in their place and say, man, 
what they needed to hear from Jesus. I don't know what they need. They need to hear something other than snoring, right? They woke him up and they rebuked him for not caring. I love that. They, they take time out of bailing, right? They're like, ah, whatever they're doing, you know, whatever they're doing, they take the time to say, this guy needs to be awake. And they say, don't you care that we're dying? And it's clear from the rest of the story, one thing's clear, is that they didn't expect him to still the storm. They didn't expect him to be able to because they were shocked when he did. They were like, who is this, right, later on. So it wasn't that they thought necessarily, he's, they were not yet convinced fully or fully aware of who he was. They knew he was special, but they didn't really come to the idea that he had the control of nature like this. This was part of this story is that his supernatural character is being dis displayed here for the first time for them in, in a bigger way than even they'd seen. They'd seen blind people you know, receive their sight and stuff like that, or lepers, but these were individual things. They had never seen something on this magnitude. And so they tell him, hey, don't, don't you care that we're dying? Do something. I mean, pray, pray, pray or something. I mean, steer or do something, but don't sleep through it. And I don't know whether they thought he would miraculously produce a bigger bucket or, you know, maybe something like that. I'm not sure what the size of the miracle they were hoping would happen. Are just frustrated to see someone else at peace when they were falling to pieces. And I don't know about you, but I've seen this in my own life. You know, it's, I, it's the Mary Martha syndrome, but it's basically the most annoying thing in the world when you're going through something difficult is for somebody to be calm. Um, it, it really is. It's like, what, what's the matter with you? Do you not see how bad things are right now? And they're like, peace, be still. And you're like, oh, give me a break. Get out of here. You know, we don't need that kind of hippie junk. Get out of here, man. This is a serious problem. And, and so I think about this. Again, if I were that guy with a train coming my way and someone just, you know, sent me a text, peace be still, brother, I'd be like, that's wonderful, but I'm on the track and you aren't. So when you see this, you can picture him with them saying, look, at least if we're going to all drown, I want you to see it. I want you to go down with me, right? And it's easy for me to think of it as funny because I wasn't there. And I know how the story ends, but they didn't. And it was no laughing matter to them. So they are upset and they're shaking him and they're like, do you not care? And I've said that to God. I don't know if you have. I've rebuked God before. I suppose God's rebuked me a few times too. But, you know, I've, I've shaken my fist uh, metaphorically or even physically at him before. I've been a pretty stinking upset at some stuff before. And basically the content of that message was in the midst of some chaos, some confusion, don't you care? I mean, you don't care. And I think this is really interesting because the wind and the wave did not wake Jesus up. But you know what did? The cries of people saying, you don't care. See, he didn't, he didn't get woken up by the huge wave or the splash of water coming in. He's snoring through that. But he could not ignore the cries of the people close to him saying, you don't care at all. See, and so he didn't roll over and go back to sleep he got up and he said took care of the situation i think this is great he changed the physical situation but more than that he changed the spiritual climate there and i think that is the universal lesson again there's people who would love this to be that all i got to do is wake jesus up right and he will calm my storm and that's not the message of mark it's not the message of any of the gospels it is that when there's still a storm we can be still in the storm. You look at how Jesus was. They took him like he was, but he also took, was trying to take him to where he was. He was able to be at peace when the storm raged, and he was able to be at peace when the storm was not raging. And so I think about this. How does it work? How does it happen practically? Remember, he had been teaching them all day. They said that to him. Then when they wake him up, they're like, teacher, teacher, teacher teach us what we're supposed to do or you know, teach us that you care or something. He had spent all day giving them lessons on faith. You know what one of the ones that they, he had talked about? He had talked about different soils. And maybe you know the parable of the soils, you know, the hard soil and the shallow soil. And, and the shallow soil was the one where he said, here's something, but when trouble comes, the, they wilt 
they don't stand up under it because there's no root. And so one of the things he was trying to do in his disciples was grow roots in their life, right? Get them to understand that the storm is the norm. It's going to come in all forms. And guess what? It doesn't mean you're outside the will of God. Doesn't mean God's asleep. Doesn't mean anything other than there's lessons to learn. And teaching is always followed by testing. I don't know a teacher who doesn't test. Even I, who tend to wrap my tests around such sugar that people don't even know that they're getting them in class. You know, that's what I love to do. I like, to, oh, Mr. C, he never tests us on stuff. And I'm like, I test him all the time. And one of the things that I tell him is, I'm not testing you, but life will test you on what I have said today. I have given you a lesson today and watch for the lab. Watch for the lab. There will be a lab session. I won't be the guy in the coat. You know, I don't know who it'll be, but somebody will test you on what I just told you. And so when you think about this, Jesus had told them all kinds of things. And they had sat through a whole day's worth of lessons that were just theory until they got burned into their brain through the suffering. And I think about this, Jesus knew they weren't perishing. The fact that he was sleeping uh, meant that he was teaching them before he told them, peace be still. He'd already told them, you can still be at peace when life's going to pieces. And they said, yeah, check, got it in my notes here. Got it in my notebook. And he said, yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to go to sleep and see if you all understand that. And when I think about this, so much that I, I, I could and, and, and you know, comment on it, but I think more than anything, just watch for the lab sessions, watch for the lab sessions, because God teaches us stuff in theory, but then he gives us an opportunity to practice it. And it was part of his lesson plan, right? Teachers do that, at least theoretically. We're supposed to do our lesson plans, right? We plan for the day. And, and so students may be shocked by a pop quiz, but I look at my notes and it's like, pop quiz? It's not a pop to me. I knew it, right? And so Jesus was at peace in the storm because he knew it was part of the curriculum, so to speak. Psalm 121, if you think on this one with me, it says, he who keeps you will not slumber. The God of Israel doesn't sleep. So God, you know, the father was awake when the son was asleep. The son came as he was. This is the, you know, again, the fascinating, amazing thing of scripture to me that I can never put really into words, but he emptied himself of his divinity. And yet he, again, met us where we were in our humanity and drew us toward eternity. That's the whole thing that he's doing, right? So he, Jesus, has these startling characteristics where he's all human and all God, and you see both of them coming out. So he goes to sleep, but he's really not asleep. He's totally aware all the time. And the next time you feel like shaking God by the shoulder and saying, don't wake up, don't you care? Take a look at verse 39 and see if he cares. Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now, this, the, the literal words that he used there is be muzzled. By the way, this way back in Mark 125, I, if you remember it by any chance, there was a time he en encountered a demonic uh, spirit and he said, be quiet. Um, be muzzled. I mean, you barking dog, you little yapper, just be quiet. And this is what he says to the storm. He just says, muzzle that, you know, just shut it down. And it's amazing because it's almost like a movie set thing where I don't know if you've been to one of those special effects things at a, at a um, amusement park, but we've been at them in Florida, you know, and they have these ones where they're uh, Universal Studios and they reset it for the next people. I mean, it's like this crazy thing where Jaws is coming out and the tracks going down, the fires bursting out and everything's going on. Rain comes down, then your little train goes past that thing and you look back and Jaws goes back into the water and they reset it for the next guy. And there's like a great calm. It's like just two seconds ago, this thing was a complete tornado. And, and I love that thought because... You know, there's good reason to believe that this was more than just a physical storm, more than just your everyday natural occurrence, that there was a spiritual source to it. And you know what? Again, I'm not a guy, as you probably know by now, to see a demon under every rock. But you know what? Demons are real to, to 
uh, me to the scripture. If there are angels, there are demons, and there are both, and there are spiritual things behind physical realities in our life that we see and we don't see sometimes. And so I think it's interesting that we, uh, you know, when when it's insurance claims and stuff, they uh, aspire or they ascribe it to God. It's an act of God, and you go well. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, you know, Mother Nature. I'm like, that's not very nice to your mom. Uh, you know, th that's an insult to mothers and God. I, I think there are other sources sometimes of things. And again, I wouldn't ascribe every little bump in the road to a demonic thing in my life. But I certainly need to see that physical storms have spiritual connections and spiritual sources. And you know what? Sometimes the storm will rage and I'll... I need to. Ha I still have a storm, but God will teach me to be still in the storm. And other times, He's going to just say, "That's enough. That's enough for now." And pfft, there's like a great calm. And I, I've often found it fascinating the two sides of miracles. Again, I'm just sharing with you things that have meant something to me over the years. And there's there's a time in the scriptures where they don't catch anything all night, and then the next moment they're catching so much they can't put it on the nets and i've often thought there's two miracles in that the non-catch was a miracle and then the overcatch was a miracle there were two miracles the 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 sustaining and restraining things of god where you kind of go you know what it was crazy that there was this massive storm this was disproportionate and then you also say but the calm is like mm -hmm, like immediately over and you're like well what was that <laughs> because you and I both know that storms tend to dissipate, you know, sort of over time. But this one's like, bonk. And so I think about this in my life. I can still be in the will, but it's not always still in the will, right? What do I mean by that? God's will will take me in and through storms, through storms, you know. Sometimes it'll be still and I go, wow, ah, this is it. Yes. Let's build a tabernacle here. This must be God's will for me. And people think and say so often to people that storms in our life are evidence that, you know, maybe God's trying to teach us something, you know, and like as soon as we learn it, we'll be out of the storm. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I learn more in storms than I do out of them. I don't know. I'm a pretty slow learner, but not necessarily. Paul was in the will of God, and his life was constantly stormy constantly he got out of one shipwreck and into another you know if you if he ever showed up on your boat you would have said listen i don't think this is the boat for you um you know they, you really should take a tour with these people they're far better you know and and I, jonah you know yes he was there was a storm when he was in the boat and when he was back in the will of god the storm kind of died down or did it i mean there was a craziness on land that's why i say storms come in all forms so they're not all just you know, out of the out of the whale and into the into the frying pan, and yet you look at it and you look back to Mark four thirty six. It says other boats followed. I don't want to make this too metaphorical, but you know what? Other boats followed, and the truth is, other people look at our lives. And I like the fact that it even says smaller boats followed. You know, and and if you think of this in in any way, there were twelve here who were quickly growing. Uh, the reputation as those are the followers of Jesus. I mean, they were pretty fresh followers, let's face it, but they were a little further along than the other people. So there were people in the other boats going, what's happening over there? And how are they reacting to stuff? And I think about it in my own life. You know, I think about the little boats in my life, whoever they might be, and think to myself, well, I got to do a little better. Um, I got to do a little better than that after all these years. You know, I can't quite be the guy going, we're going down when there's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. There's other boats looking on. And I've thought about this in so many ways in my role as a parent, in my role as a employee or employer or leader in any capacity, a teacher in any capacity. Um, and so I need to learn how to peace be still even when I'm falling to pieces because, again, people are going to look to that example, and they should. And so the people on the shore, there were people who were on the shore, right? There are people who followed in boats, and they got a little bit of the storm, and then there were people who ran around the shore. It actually says that in other Gospels. That there's some people who said they either couldn't get a boat or they didn't get a boat, so they watched it from afar. And again, when I think about this, they missed 
the storm, didn't they? But they also missed the miracle and they missed the message. They, they did not get the same experience of peace be still from the shore as the people did in the boat. And it's one of the things that I've kind of, my deal with the Lord, so to speak, if I have one, is that I would rather be in the boat with Jesus than on the shore with the spectators, just in general. I mean, whatever that means along this life's journey, I'm like, uh, I, I expect that the waves are a little bit crazier out in the ocean or out in the sea than they are on the shore. But guess what? That's also where the lessons are. That's where the faith is built. That's where life is lived, you know? And so when you think about that, I'm not, I'm not you know, so martyrdom or, or, you know, martyr-oriented or, you know, just a sicko that says, bring on the wind and waves. You know, I'm not that guy. But I'm like, bring on life. <laughs> Let life do what life does. What a waste it would be to go through this life with sort of like nothing learned, nothing ventured, nothing lost, nothing gained, just kind of made it through. And so Jesus tells the storm to take a time out, you know, sit down, be quiet. So he tells the storm to be quiet. And this is pretty funny. There's an instant calm. But then... He turns to his disciples and basically says the same thing, right? He rebukes the wind and wave, but then he gives a rebuke to them. They're kind of soaking wet. They're like, uh, what? well, maybe, maybe we overreacted a little, right? Because they're like, don't you care that we drown? He's like, huh? Uh, peace be still. And then they're like, what was it you guys were worried about? I'm going back to sleep. Um, and and he, he says, why are you so fearful? How do you have no faith? Remember, they had asked him, rebuked him, you don't care. So I guess in a way, they had opened themselves up to the right to be rebuked themselves. And he sternly re rebukes the storm, peace be still. But then he mildly rebukes the disciples. He says, why so fearful, guys? Why so faithless? Fearful, faithless. The two kind of go together, right? Fearful, <laughs> fear, or faithless. When you think about this, he says, how can you have no faith? And that may seem unfair to us. It seems a little bit. But, you know, I don't believe in here that Jesus really expects us to have a smile on our face as the storms are hitting us and all that stuff. You know, sinking ship, ha, I don't care. Um, I don't even know that he expected them to sleep through the storm or that they did the wrong thing by trying to bail or any of that kind of stuff. But the reason I, I believe it, and you might have thought this through it prior in your life, but I think this is really, if there is a meat to this message, it's this quote right here, which is, if Jesus says, let's go over, we're not going under. See, the key to the whole passage is found back in Mark 4.35. He says, let's cross over to the other side. He didn't say, let's get halfway across and drown. He said, let's go over to the other side. He had already told them things they were going to do the next day. He'd already done that with them. Now, God hasn't given me any promise that I'll be here 10 years from now, but he had given them the itinerary of what they were about to go do. And he had told them already at this point some things that needed to be accomplished in his life and in theirs. And so he tells them, let's cross over to the other side. And when you think about this, when Jesus says you're going over, you're definitely not going under. And they were rebuked for having no faith because they hadn't listened to the things he had revealed to them. There were things he hadn't revealed to them, but all he was asking them to do is believe the things he had said to them and not have to know everything. I've noticed this in my own life and in the lives of others. People need to know everything. Um, I love to know all the facts. But you know what? All the facts still aren't going to give me all the faith. If I have enough of the facts, I have all I need to have peace and be still on the inside, even when things are raging out of control on the outside. Because, again, if, if Jesus had given them you know, a, a forecast and all this kind of stuff, I don't know that it would have made it one bit of difference when they were in the middle of it. And our greatest problems, I think this shows, are within us, not around us, because in some ways, they continued to be anxious and fearful and doubtful and worried even when they weren't in the midst of a storm. 
You see this, uh, even when they get back to shore, there's so many things that were still on their mind. They weren't afraid of drowning now. Next thing they were was afraid of, you know, uh, being run out of town or that they'd run out of food or whatever else. I mean, you think about it with the Israelites, right? I'm reminding you of them. They, they went from, uh, you know, you're, we're going to drown out here in the in the as the Egyptians chase us to a few days later, it was, there's no water and we're going to die from the drought. So you think about this. <laughs> Verse 41, they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is a different kind of fear. Maybe it's the beginning of the kind of fear they really needed, the kind that chases out all other fears. It's not really a cowardly fear. It's the word the Bible uses for awe and respect in the presence of overwhelming power. They were kind of like, <laughs> I was scared of the storm, but now I'm kind of scared of Jesus in some ways because I'm realizing he's even more powerful than the things that overwhelm me. He's overwhelming to the things that overwhelm me. And when I think about this, the stressing blew in a blessing, right? That's what I wrote down in my notes. The stressing blew down a blessing, which is an expanded view of who Jesus was, an expanded view of what life was all about. And they had seen him perform miracles again. They'd heard him preach messages. He was a very godly man to them, even a very special godly man. But he was not yet Lord of Lords, King of Kings, God of gods to them, right? They had a pretty small view of him overall. Psalm 107, which they had grown up knowing, said that only the Lord, L-O-R-D, only the great I am could still a storm. And here he was connecting those dots to what they knew in theory, to what they were experiencing in practice. And I want to end with a thought on this, which is the spiritual really spiritual implication for us because um, crossing over, when you think about what crossing over is, he says, let us cross over. And you know my love for words and their multiple meanings, but when you think about the cross, I can't help but think about what it is to cross over to something with the, the awareness of what the cross means. Because Jesus, right, he went through a personal storm, <laughs> uh, unlike anything, you know, the and, and crazy things happened on the day of his crucifixion, right? Amazing things. Uh, graves opened, rocks split, all kinds of uh, physical manifestations that people would have been saying, wow, natural disasters happening all over. But it's because there was a supernatural disaster occurring. But it wasn't really a disaster, was it? What would have looked on the surface to be the worst of all days was the best of all days, and it's coming up for us, right? Good Friday. And I've always said that every Friday is a good Friday, right? Uh, for me, it is. Uh, so maybe we should rename that one Great Friday, right? But, but what was great about it? Well, it wasn't great in and of itself. If you looked only at the, the perspective of that day, you would say a great and godly man was silenced, killed, tortured, innocent, treated unjustly. I mean, there, there isn't anything good on that day except the perspective of history that came quickly enough three days later but spreads yet to this day, which is, is if the cross is the end, well, then that's it. So if the grave is the end, if the tomb is it, um, there isn't much good news here. But crossing over and what the cross means, he says, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care that we're perishing? Well, I can never hear the word perish without thinking of John 3.16, probably the most famous of all gospel passages, which is um, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Does that, does that mean won't physically die? Well, obviously, perish is a richer word than that. It's more than that. And there's a crossing over from this life to eternity that occurs in a person's life where he says, but that is not the end and not the totality of the story. To look at a person's life and say, this person's life ended tragically. And you go, well, it transitioned tragically, didn't it? But it didn't end tragically. It segued, if I could use that word. And, and you go, yeah, is it difficult to cross over? Well, if you think metaphorically of life as a lake, right? 
there's going to be a time where he says, let's cross over to the other side and cross over to the other side. And, and they're thinking to tomorrow where we'll do more ministry and we'll do that. But each one of these guys, we're going to cross over to the other side, right? And the cross was really the thing that made that possible. And I think this, when you think about it, don't you care that we're perishing? There's people who look down here and say, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you see the storms we go through? Don't you see the difficulty this life presents? Don't you see how hard this is? Don't you see the toll road I'm on? Don't you see the beating we take, you know, on the way? And he says, well, you know, you're just kind of crossing over the lake. But I did promise you that we're going over, not under and there's so many times in life that I felt like I was going under. Man, I'm going under. This is it for me. Ah, there's no hope. And he goes, I told you we're going over. You're not going under. And, you know, how I'll exit this world, it could go very smoothly. Or it could go very unsmoothly. It could be pretty rough. Who knows? Different, different experiences, different ways. But what I do know is when I look at it, I say crossing over. I'm going to come out safe on the other side. Jesus said I would. Which means I may be still falling to pieces and I can say peace be still. And again, it's not something I can say to somebody from the outside. It's something God has to say to me from the inside. So it's not advice I give to somebody with a train coming at them. Don't worry, brother. Just be at peace. That's, that's just agitating. That's just worse. But if God whispers that to my heart and says, my son, peace be still. Let's go back to sleep. <laughs> uh, we're going through a lot of things, but we're going through a lot of things. And all those things that we go through take us to a side that Jesus says, that eternity, that's why I went to the cross. So whenever you think of crossing over a lake or crossing over the storm, the, the immediate calm on the other side of that storm, there will be a final storm in my life. And at the end of that, ah, an eternal calm in which nobody's going to have to say, looks like a storm's coming. They're going to say, another beautiful, endless day. Nice. What should we do? I guess go fishing. Thank you, Lord, for uh, these thoughts. I, I hope that they are not to me or to any, just a, a pie in the sky in the great by and by, but they are truly guiding principles, thoughts, reality. Uh, you really were crucified. You really were hurt. You really were as we are. Uh, and you did that. You came as we are so that we could be as you are. And uh, we're going to get little glimpses of it. There's going to be peace that passes our understanding. And then there's going to be uh, things that go past our understanding and we're not at peace. But we're, we've had a little foretaste of heaven. And we know what it is to spiritually have something within us that keeps us calm in the midst of the craziest things. And we know uh, that you give us a capacity that we don't have on our own. And I pray that anyone in a little boat anywhere near our life, um, whether they see us freaking out or you saying, peace be still, uh, that they would see you in that process. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.